All right, so this video is going to be on conjugated dyings and UV light. Okay, so um, here we go. We got we know that light is energy, right? So um, let's say we have an orbital containing some electrons, right? The the ground state is when those electrons are kind of at their most stable position. <clears throat> and then if you shine light on a compound, it may absorb that light and cause an electron to jump to a higher energy state. And this higher energy state is called the excited state. And the energy difference between the excited state and the ground state, or the two orbitals that are kind of moving the electrons around, are in which you are moving the electrons around, the energy difference is going to vary depending on the compound, okay? So again, we do know that light is energy, and so um, going back to our um, electromagnetic spectrum, or at least a portion of it, we have our UV region, we have the visible region, uh, and then we have the infrared. So we know that infrared radiation is used in IR spectroscopy, and um, that specific region um, is absorbed by molecules as well, but it is absorbed and it just causes like vibrations within that molecule, right? Um, now, when we talk about visible or UV, um, those are going to be a little bit different there. So UV, for example, is um, we have an increased frequency, and so it's going to have an increased uh, energy. Okay, so higher energy for UV light. Um, and then it's also going to have lower wavelengths. So uh, we have increased wavelength as we go from UV to visible to infrared, right? And so um, the UV region is really what we want to focus on when we're talking about light and conjugated bonds. And that rate, those, those wavelengths range from 200 to 400 nanometers. Now, uh, let's take a look at this butadiene and this cyclohexadiene. Um, these particular molecules absorb light. Oh, sorry. They absorb light and it's about going uh, 217 nanometers that wavelength for the butadiene and then 256 for the cyclohexadiene. Okay, so notice the difference in wavelengths, right? So 217 nanometers is less than 256 nanometers um, and that uh, we'll discuss why in a second, okay? Now, drawing the, this pentane and this pentadiene, we have a sigma bond compared to isolated dienes, right? So the above dienes are conjugated dienes as, as opposed to those isolated dienes, or the isolated diene below. <clears throat> um, the sigma bond and the isolated dienes generally absorb wavelengths below 200 nanometers, whereas the conjugated dienes absorb uh, within that 200, even above the 400 nanometer uh, range okay that's kind of we're we're talking about visible spectrum now this goes back to the excited state and ground state right i said that the difference in energy for the excited state and ground state is going to vary uh, depending on the compounds that you're working with right so there is a general trend for that um where the uh we can have an increase or decrease in energy and um so let's explain that right now. We have lambda max is really how we want to discuss the absorption of light. And it represents the wavelength of light that it absorbs. Okay. So <clears throat> it's um, 217 nanometers for this butadiene that we mentioned before. It's 268 nanometers and then 364 for those following compounds, right? Now, when we look at those, we see that there's two pi bonds three pi bonds, and then six pi bonds, right? And so we also see the general increase in the wavelength, right? <clears throat> and so this is the trend associated um, with the decrease in that energy, okay? So remember, the higher the lambda max, the lower the energy wavelengths, because the longer wavelengths means that it's a uh, higher, or sorry, lower frequency, and lower frequency is lower energy. Okay, so that means if we had, um, if we went back to that kind of diagram of the excited state, <clears throat> we have um, the excited state of this, let's just say it applies to the butadiene above, the 217 nanometers. 
this is an arbitrary value as well. I'm just, just this is just for uh, kind of the purpose of explaining the trend. Okay, so we have that specific energy associated with this two conjugated pi bonds. Okay, now if we have three conjugated pi bonds, the absorption goes to 268 nanometers, which is a higher wavelength and a lower energy. So that means that that gap required less energy for the electron to jump from the ground state to the excited state, okay? Now, <clears throat> if you go to six pi bonds, that energy gap is even smaller, and that means that it requires less energy for that electron to jump up, okay? And so that's the trend. So as the number of conjugated bonds increases, um, the um, lambda max will also increase, okay? And that's because we're absorbing lower energy light, okay? So again, as the number of conjugated pi bonds increase, the energy difference between the ground state and the excited state decreases. Now to help remember this, I like to think the longer the conjugation, uh, the longer the wave wavelength that it absorbs. And so that means it's lower energy. Uh, you can also think of the longer compounds as more stable because they have more resonance structures. So more resonance structures means more stable, okay? And so that system is going to absorb larger wavelengths and lower energy light. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully that helps kind of explain uh, the trend for um, conjugated pi bonds and their absorption of light. So now let's bring up some practical examples. So lycopene, for example, is shown here. And lycopene's got conjugated bonds for days. There's like 11 conjugated bonds, okay? And um, so the reason why I bring this up is because when you have more than eight conjugated bonds, you can start to absorb in the visible spectrum, okay? And hence the color wheel, right? Um, we got red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. I'll explain why in a second, but we absorb in the visible spectrum and not just in the UV region anymore, okay? So system absorbs the larger wavelengths. There's the visible spectrum, just a little bit to the right of the UV, right? So lambda max for lycopene is about 470 nanometers, and that is within the visible spectrum, and it happens to be in the bluish green um, region. Okay, and so the color wheel works when drawn properly. If you have the six colors in there, um, the opposite colors on the color wheel complement one another. So, it, for example, a lycopene absorbs in the blue-green region, or let's just say green, and opposite of green on the color wheel is red. So it absorbs the red, green and it reflects the red, okay? So if it were to absorb the blue, it would reflect the orange, okay? Uh, or et cetera, et cetera, I like right? this aspect of the color wheel because it's, it's, it's actually pretty cool. Have you ever noticed um, like the Laker colors are purple and gold? Those are opposite on the color wheel. Or uh, like Boise is, I think they're like blue and orange. Or um, Christmas colors are red and green. Those are opposite on the color wheel. That's fancy, right? <laughs> uh, it's a cool, I like that aspect of it. But um, anyway, beta carotene, right? Carrots, I mean, they're, you got like, I don't know if they're called heirloom carrots. I would say they are just because they're like tomatoes. But beta carotene is, or I'm sorry, carrots are generally orange, right? And so beta carotene absorbs or has a lambda max of 455 nanometers. And so this 459.5 nanometers is more in the blue region, and the opposite of the blue on the color wheel is orange. Absorbs blue, reflects orange, carrots are orange, and that's all she wrote. What's up, Doc? Don't forget your carrots, because it's good for your eyeballs. And we'll talk about that stuff uh, in a, a later chapter. Um, but for now, let's talk about sunscreen, since we're talking about light. We want to use... Uh, sunscreens to protect us from the sun's UV radiation, right? Uh, we did also talk about how ozone helps protect us from UV, but 
the stuff that gets through can um, make contact with our skin and if overexposure can result in skin cancer, unfortunately. All right, so here is a good DNA on the left and a damaged DNA on the right. So notice that the thymine portion of the uh, DNA sequence uh, has two pi bonds. Those two pi bonds, when they're exposed to light, can actually react with one another. They form a, they do a cycloaddition reaction, which basically is just the formation of a ring. And that damaged DNA, because it's not normal, then results in cancer. Okay, and so uh, you don't really have to know those details. I just kind of wanted to show you because I think it's actually really cool and interesting. And so, um, when it when it comes to protecting our skin so that this does not happen, you want to use sunscreens. Uh, most protect us against UVB because it is the most harmful uh, <clears throat> type of UV for us, but uh, UVA does penetrate the skin more, so it can wreak havoc on our body as well. Uh, typically, we could use titanium oxide or zinc oxide. Those are going to be inorganic sunscreens. Uh, and then the, run, the rest of them below are organic sunscreens, of course, because they have they look like typical organic molecules, right? Um, one thing I want to point out, <clears throat> a little fun fact, UVB, uh, the SPF on sunscreens is actually referring to the sunproof factor associated with uh, kind of preventing UVB from hitting our skin. And so that's not specific to UVA. Um, that's something that we don't have here in the U.S. at least. Okay. Uh, I did also point out that the 4-methylbenzylidine camphor is a fun little sunscreen. Um, we did sun, we did camphor if you have the lab. You did that, uh, or at least chemistry with it. So just wanted to point that out. Fun stuff. <clears throat> you should try and see if you can make that. See, if that, that'll be fun. Uh, vitamin D is the last subject. Um, again... This is just some fun stuff that I wanted to bring up because you know that in order to get uh, vitamin D, you got to get some sun, right? And so <clears throat> how does this work? Well, we have a similar type of reaction. We're kind of um, shifting bonds around to a cyclic re type reaction. This is actually a sigma sigmatropic one because you can see that we're moving sigma bonds. Um, but this species on the top, when exposed to light, it opens up and it forms this new uh, triene. And then that triene, you can see all those arrows kind of shuffled around. They <clears throat> undergo a sigmatropic reaction to form the vitamin D substance on the right. Now, above, I just pointed out that uh, we can have the ergosterol or 7 dehydrocholesterol, where the R groups are slightly different. And so that's going to give you your vitamin D2 or vitamin D3, depending on what your source is. So uh, mushrooms or whatever um, for D2, but fish and dairy for D3. Uh, also, fun fact, so all milk is irradiated with UV light. So that way you can convert your 7-dehydrocholesterol to vitamin D3. And that's why those things are like kind of vitamin D rich. Okay, so... Um, Otherwise, that would just be your 7-dehydrocholesterol. So, kind of cool, right? You hit it with some lights, things kind of shift around, and you get this actually useful vitamin D. Uh, super fun. You don't need to know the names of the uh, mechanisms, but they are. But the fun facts you do. I really want you to kind of... It's incentive to watch the video, too. But it's also really fun stuff. Um, and... I just do want to point out, though, that they are electrocyclic reactions. This one specifically in that second step is a 1-7 sigmatropic rearrangement. And this is a common thing. We don't really go into details in this particular class of these types of mechanisms, but I did want to point them out because they are pretty common <clears throat> and uh, pretty, useful, um, pretty useful mechanisms. They're actually, uh, you can make some really cool compounds. But anyway... There you go, that's vitamin D, a little lycopene and beta carotene for you, as well as some sunscreen. So don't forget your uh, don't forget your carrots. Bye.